this video is going to get you through the epidemiology lecture, um, which is in chapter 19 of some versions of the book and chapter 20 in older editions of the book, so look in the right version for you. Um, once again, we're going to start with an important person for this chapter. This happens to be, in my opinion, one of the most unfortunate gentlemen that was trying to help people live better lives back in those days, Ignace Simmelweiss. Um, basically, doctors at the time, they never washed their hands. They would go directly from patient one to patient two, spreading whatever disease patient one had to patient two. One of the things that he was noticing is that doctors would go straight from doing an autopsy on a person who had an infectious disease and then go deliver a baby and then surprise surprise the mom would get sick with that infectious disease and then die after she gave birth and sometimes the baby would end up getting sick as well um specifically the disease that he was focusing on at this point was pure pearl fever um and it ended up killing a lot of mothers postpartum because the doctors were spreading it from previous patients to the mom and then the mom would get sick because she had lots of bleeding after the birth and so the chances of mom being exposed were very high because of all the blood um, and torn tissues that would result after that birth. Um, when Semmelweis tried to tell doctors, hey, maybe don't go straight from autopsies to deliver a baby right afterwards, maybe wash your hands in between those people, people got so mad at him that he got not only fired from his job, but they kicked him out of the country that he lived in at the time. Um, he eventually got institutionalized and then died of an infection. It's just, the, his story is so tragic. He was trying to help people. The reason why I keep talking about Semmelweis uh, year after year after year is because doctors, a lot of them, not all of them, they tend to have this God complex. And if you tell them that they're doing something wrong, they will lash out at you like you're the problem. Um, doctors will do this sometimes with patients, like if the patient says, could you please wash your hands before you treat me? The doctor might actually fire that patient, which should not happen. Um, if nurses try to tell the doctors, the nurses will get reprimanded. It can go into files and make it more difficult for them to find jobs later on. So the bad stuff that happened to Semmelweis, while not as severe today, it can still happen if people are trying to call attention to mistakes that doctors make or just simple stuff like make sure you wash your hands between patients. Doctors still tend to have a little bit of kickback when it comes to that. So try to find ways. There's usually an infection control committee at different hospitals. People tend to not like that committee, but they're trying to help reduce hospital acquired infections. And so pay attention to those people and don't hate them. They're trying to help out. Um, epidemiology. Epidemiologists are usually medical doctors. They go out and they try to find like what's the causative agent for a particular disease. So when COVID first started at the end of 2019, epidemiologists went out and they tried to figure out, well, where did the first patient go that might have exposed them to what we now know is a viral disease? What are we finding in all the patients that have this symptom? That must be the causative agent. So we know it's a coronavirus that's causing that infection. But epidemiologists are the people who collect all of that data for us. Um, now, usually I tended to spout on about Ebola in here. And yeah, there was Ebola that there is still Ebola endemic in certain areas in Africa. There's an outbreak that is going on right now, but that's of course taken a backseat to COVID infections. Um, epidemiologists though, they're still trying to figure out where Ebola hides when it's not in people. Um, the current leading idea is it tends to hide out in bats. Um, people might be exposed to that when they go into caves where bats are roosting and so they get exposed to the fecal material from the bats. It could also be it lives in a different ape populations and when a person kills and eats an ape then they get infection from that so there's different ideas about how ebola might jump from the animal kingdom into the human kingdom um which we are in different we're in the same kingdom but whatever hopefully you get what i'm trying to say there all right communicable versus non-communicable diseases so communicable just means contagious it can spread from person to person examples of communicable diseases are ebola the flu um, COVID. Um, what is not a non-communicable disease is cancer, which is what these women are all walking for to try to raise money to try to find cures, in this case, for breast cancer. You can't catch breast cancer. Like, if your best friend has it, she's not going to give it to you. Um, there are genetic components to that, but it is a non-communicable disease. 
Um, autoimmune diseases are non-communicable. So if you have a friend who has lupus, she can't give that to you. There's a whole slew of non-communicables that are out there. They tend to be more genetic based sort of things. Mm -hmm. All right, after this, you have a whole slew of different definitions. They're pretty easy for you guys to look up easily, but I'm gonna link most of these to the COVID pandemic that is currently happening. I'm recording this in uh, June of 2020. And so I'm trying to pull the most recent data based on what we have. This is coming from a descriptive study from the CDC that was recently published and they update it every week on the MMWR, which we'll talk a little bit about later on. Um, attack rate is the percentage of people who become ill in a population after they get exposed to a particular infectious agent. Um, it helps to tell you how many people are susceptible to something. The incidence is the number of new cases in a specific time period in a population. And notice that word incidence keeps coming up in this descriptive study. And they aren't just telling you like overall incidence, they're telling you within specific age groups and within specific races and ethnicities, who is more likely to get this disease. Because yeah, as it turns out, COVID is a sexist disease. It tends to affect men more problematically than women there's a testosterone link to that and the incidence helps us to see that link and understand that men are more likely to have complications as especially men who have higher testosterone levels are more likely to have complications of COVID-19. Um, prevalence is another one on this one it's the total number of cases that are present in a population at a time. Um, right now in Cleburne Really, they do it for Johnson County as a whole, but I live in Cleburne, so those are the numbers that I tend to look at. They'll tell you how many cases we've had total, how many people currently still have COVID-19, and then how many resolved cases we have. So they're giving us the prevalence data. Next up, morbidity versus mortality. Morbidity just tells you how many people are sick with a disease in a population that's at risk. Um, mortality tells you how many people are more likely to die in a population due to a particular disease. So I'm showing you two different viral infections. This is the flu virus. This is Ebola. The flu has a crazy high morbidity rate, but not a super high mortality rate. And so a lot of people get sick from the flu, but it doesn't really kill all that many people every year. It does have a mortality rate. That's important to know. People die from the flu every single year. It's just not a high mortality rate. Uh, Ebola, on the other hand, has a fairly low morbidity. It, it takes a lot of contact to actually infect a person with Ebola, but it has a crazy high mortality rate, especially in countries that don't have very good medical care. And so for every disease, there's different percentages of morbidity and mortality that tells you how that particular infectious agent might affect a population over time. Um, this is from that same descriptive stata off over here. It's showing you the morbidity as related to hospitalization for people who got sick from COVID-19. This is the total number of cases that got reported. And these were how many of them had been hospitalized. Um, what this doesn't tell you is how many of these cases right here actually had symptoms, how many of them um, were asymptomatic, that's not really on here. More than likely, this is going to lean more towards the people who had symptoms because people don't want to go get that test unless they've actually had some symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, case fatality rate is the percentage of a population that dies from a specific disease. Um, again, fairly easy definition there. Next, endemic versus sporadic. So an endemic disease is one that's present in the population all the time. Like the common cold is an endemic illness. Sporadic, on the other hand, means you get little outbreaks and then it goes away over time. Um, so this is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is what this person has. That's more of a sporadic illness versus one that's present in the population all the time. An epidemic is an unusually large number of cases. Um, that's what COVID started out as when it was in Wuhan, China. It then outbroke into more populations over time. So we got a cluster of cases in a brief time period that affected that specific population. But then because of travel, it spread to other places and it became pandemic. And at that point, a pandemic is a worldwide epidemic. Um, it basically spread everywhere. It spread apparently in the United States first in the Pacific Northwest around Washington and Oregon. It spread to Europe very quickly. In fact, there was a recent study that showed that there was COVID-19 present in um, wastewater samples as early as November, December of 2019. And so the illness was there before we tended to think it got there. Um, now this is showing you, let's see, H1N1, I'm trying to remember, 2009, I think this was swine flu. And show, so it was showing 
how far swine flu had spread at that time. All right, reservoirs of infection. Um, a reservoir is essentially the natural habitat that that particular infectious agent tends to live in. And there's three different options for this. It can live only in humans, it can live in other animals plus humans, or it can live in the environment. What I want you to know is if something only lives in humans, it's a lot easier for us to eradicate it because all we have to do is eradicate it from human hosts and then we should be able to wipe that disease out. I'm not saying we can do that all the time. Again, if there are people who are asymptomatic carriers, that becomes a lot more difficult, but it's a lot easier for us to deal with things that are spread human to human only than it is for us to treat things that also hide out in animals or the environment. So I do want you to know that animal reservoirs and environmental reservoirs are a lot harder for us to eliminate because you can't vaccinate people and then leave raccoons out when you're trying to take care of rabies because then it could spread from raccoons to people. Um, there are states that try to put out like rabies baits to try to vaccinate wild animals, but the chance that you actually vaccinate them all is super duper low. And so it's going to be nearly impossible for us to actually eradicate a rabies virus, for example. Um, I do also want to make a note that that term zoonotic is going to come back here. And I think I've put it in your notes at this point. So a zoonosis is an animal disease that can spread to people like swine flu from earlier. Um, human reservoirs, this is just an example for you guys to have. Smallpox only infected humans. That's why we were able to eradicate it, because we just put out this huge vaccination campaign, and we haven't seen that disease since the 1970s. Um, mumps is another one that's human only. Gonorrhea is another one, and this is where I'll stop and mention there are lots of people out there who have asymptomatic gonorrhea infections, and that's why that one's very difficult for us to wipe out of the population. Um, there were very few people who had smallpox who were asymptomatic, and so that's why that one was a lot easier for us to deal with. Um, animal reservoirs, I mentioned rabies earlier, that's a pretty decent example. There's Campylobacter, Salmonella. Anytime you see any kind of recall that has to do with like lettuce or tomatoes, that disease usually came from animal feces that got onto that particular food item, and so it went from animals onto our food and then we ate the food and then we got sick from them. Um, environmental reservoirs. Every year there are people around the world who end up developing anthrax because Bacillus anthracis lives in the soil. If you plow up the soil, you aerosolize some of those spores and once you breathe them in, you can get respiratory anthrax. So you're always going to see cases of anthrax because it leaves in the soil. You can't exactly go sterilize all the soil and then, yay, we've eradicated it. It's just not possible. Same with water up over here. So polio can hide in water. That's why it's been very difficult for us to eradicate polio. We've gotten it out of a lot of places, but you can still find it in some of the countries within Africa. Um, cholera is another one that's very difficult for us to deal with because it can be found in the water. And if you drink contaminated water, then you get cholera. Um, I've already defined that often enough, but this is just giving you several different diseases that are zoonotic, again, spread from animals into people. Um, around in our parts in Texas, ringworm is a very common one where usually some child pets some animal that they don't know because it was super cute. Um, Hewland Park is really good at having lots of cats that roam the park. So if your kid pets that cat and then doesn't tell you about it, well, that kid might have picked up ringworm from that. And then it can get from one kid to the next kid. And then your whole family has a ringworm outbreak and it's a whole nightmare. Um, toxoplasmosis is an infection that means that... Okay, so there's several things. First, it tends to hang out in rats and cats. If a pregnant mom um, cleans the cat litter of a cat that was infected with toxoplasma, then mom can spread the toxoplasma to her baby and it can cause a, an overwhelming infection in the baby. And so that's one, basically a cat ate a rat that was infected, the cat got infected, the cat spread the toxoplasma to the mom and then the mom gave it to the baby. It's kind of a complicated little life cycle, but that can happen. Um, kids tend to not have problems eating things they shouldn't eat and so they can get worms from dogs that have worms too. So. Oh, there you go. Nice, nice fun picture for you. Hopefully you're not watching this early in the morning or while you're eating, I don't know, something with some nice flaky Parmesan cheese on it. Have that as an image. Uh, what is a portal of exit? It's essentially just a way that an infectious agent leaves the body. Um, is it the same for all microbes? No, it does relate back to the mechanism of transmission. So remember there's fecal oral, there's respiratory infections, and there's direct contact. 
Well, that relates back to portals of exit. If you have a respiratory infection that can be breathed in and obtained, that tends to mean it gets breathed out as a portal of exit. So respiratory portals of, of exit do exist, um, usually as respiratory droplets. Um, if it's a direct contact sort of a thing, then you can get it from shed skin. So this person has a raging case of athlete's foot. Hopefully you all know that if you go shower in a public shower, you should wear shower shoes. It's to protect you from exactly this right here. Also, side note, before you put socks and shoes on, your feet should be clean and dry before you put those on because fungus likes warm, moist places. And so it's more likely to develop if you just put your feet in shoes when they're still wet. Um, feces is a huge one. Again, going back to that fecal oral route of transmission, you get rid of a bunch of things through the feces, including some of your normal flora that it's supposed to be in your intestines, but you shouldn't exactly go put it in your mouth or pick your nose after you've wiped your butt because then you've got those same organisms in a different place. Um, semen can carry lots of things. It has been shown that people who have Ebola shed the Ebola virus through their semen for several months after that infection and that there's some evidence to show even years after that infection. Um, and then saliva, which kind of goes back to respiratory droplets, is another one. <laughs> Portal of entry. Again, this is your mechanism for transmission. It's how does it get into the body? So yeah, breathing it, mouth and nose. Um, people touching their eyes all the time. You need to remember your eyes are connected to your nasal cavity. Remember your lacrimal caruncle and then, they, then the canal that drains the tears into the nose. That's a way that an infectious agent can get into your respiratory system. Um, ears, it's a little bit less likely to happen, but especially if a person has a ruptured eardrum, we can get things in through the ears and have problems that way. Um, GI tract, anything that you eat or drink, it can cause infections that way. Respiratory tract, again, if you're breathing in respiratory droplets that have a viral load, you can get sick that way. Broken skin, because remember, intact skin is pretty good at keeping things out. And then genitourinary system for anything that's an STD or STI. Um, Horizontal versus vertical transmission is essentially just who's transmitting to who. Horizontal is just person to person. So if you were to have sex with this dude, which I don't recommend, uh, mostly because he's got active gonorrhea right now, you would get gonorrhea from him, and then that's a horizontal transmission where it's spread person to person. Vertical transmission means mom gives it to the baby. Um, the placenta is a lot leakier than we thought it was. And lots of infections can actually spread through the placenta. Gonorrhea can be one of those things. Although it's more likely that the baby gets it as the baby passes through the birth canal. If mom has gonorrhea and didn't know it, it can seed into the baby's eyes and cause permanent blindness. That's an example of vertical transmission where mom gave it to the baby. What are some of the methods of direct contact that can spread disease? And what are some bacteria that are transmitted through direct contact? So handshake and sex, anytime you're touching another person, um, that's how you get it. Now the hands, the problem with the hands is we touch our faces all the time. People are becoming more aware of that because of the COVID um, education that has been going out about stop touching your face. But if you touch somebody else that has an infectious agent with your hands and then you rub your eye because it itches, well, you just put that infectious agent directly into your eye. Hugs less likely to be problematic um, unless the person managed to have the infectious agent on their back. Um, fist bumps, you have less of the hand exposed. Um, there's a, an interesting greeting that has arisen in some places where they do like foot taps. You're less likely to get sick from that. And so hand shaking is a big way that you can get infections and it's not really an ideal way to greet people, although neither is kissing. You can get to spread a lot of things that way. Um, Let's see, where was I? Sex. Uh, that is a direct contact thing. Any STD, it gets spread that way. Some of the diseases that you can get this way. So this is a picture of a person who's at secondary syphilis. They have the characteristic rash that is occurring over all of the body, not just in the genital regions. So we should have already gotten antibiotics by this point, but this gentleman or lady, I can't really tell, um, has not. And so you can get syphilis through direct contact with this person. That's one of our STDs. Um, let's see, you can get Shigella this way, you can get gonorrhea this way. Think about any STD or disease that can be spread because you smeared it into your eyes and that's a direct contact sort of a thing. Fecal oral means you somehow ingested somebody else's feces. This can be you're in a country that has poor sanitation and so their water was just contaminated and you drank it. This could be you ate some shellfish that was living in contaminated water. And so all of the stuff that was contaminating the water is in these because they're filter feeders. They're going to filter bacteria out of that funky water. And so if you eat them, you can get sick from them as well. 
Um, there was a story that a National Geographic photographer mentions that I always like to talk about at this point. Um, he was traveling in India. He knows that cholera is endemic in India. And so he was doing everything that he could to avoid drinking the water that was over there um, or eating any of the foods that he thought might be contaminated. He was doing really great until he stopped by a stand that was selling watermelon and he got some, uh, it was just like a single serving piece of watermelon so he could snack on it as he was doing some shopping or photographing or whatever he was doing that day. And then he ended up getting a raging cholera infection. And what he found out later was that a lot of the street vendors, um, first off, they're selling their watermelon by weight. So what they will do to make it way more is they will take water directly from the really funky river, the Ganges, behind them. They will inject it into the watermelon to make it way more. And so he inadvertently consumed some of the contaminated water because they had injected it into the watermelon so they could make more of a profit selling that watermelon. So you have to be really careful when you're going to other countries where they have diseases that we don't necessarily have in the United States. You've got to protect yourself. Um, because they're not going to protect you. They're going to still try to make their books, essentially. Um, let's see. Describe how indirect contact to lead, can lead to an infection and define fomites. So fomites are just um, inanimate objects like sheets, clothing, doorknobs, um, stethoscopes, whatever. Anything that's not alive that touches a person, it's essentially going to be a fomite. Well, if a person with the flu just sneezed into their hand and then reached to touch the doorknob, they just put some of the flu virions onto that doorknob. Well, next, a little kid comes up and he opens the door and then proceeds to pick his nose or stick his hand in his mouth or play with the toys that are there in the doctor's office. He spreads those virions to all of those other objects and to himself, and then he can get sick from that. And so things that can be spread through direct contact they can also often be spread through indirect contact, but it does depend on how long they can live on certain objects. Um, people have done study to see how long the coronavirus, the new SARS-CoV-2, can live on inanimate objects, and it depends on what kind it is. Um, it can live on metal for a short period of time, but it can live on cardboard for a longer period of time. And so, like I said, it depends on what kind of fomite it is, how long it can live on that object. It also depends on environmental conditions and is sunlight available and a whole slew of other things as well. Um, describe droplet transmission of a pathogen. People tend to confuse this with the respiratory method. Um, and it's because as you breathe and speak and cough and sneeze, you release droplets into the air and those droplets can have viral particles or bacteria inside of them. Now this child has pertussis or whooping cough. As he sits there and coughs without covering his mouth because kids are just rude like that, he's releasing a lot of particles that have Bordetella bacteria in all of those particles. And so that's one of the reasons why whooping cough is such a very good pathogen. It can spread easily person to person through those droplets that it makes a person release by generating that cough within the respiratory system. Um, what are some foods that tend to be contaminated with pathogens? Raw meat is the big one, and that's because raw meat is a breeding ground for the bacteria that had lived in or on that meat prior to it actually getting out into the world. Um, because of the way we grow our lettuce and things like that at this point, we're also seeing more contamination on those items that just simple washing doesn't do. People don't understand when there's bacteria in the water that is watering the lettuce, the bacteria gets into the lettuce. It's not just on the surface, it's inside the lettuce at that point. And so you could wash your lettuce all day long, the bacteria is still inside of it, and so you can still get sick from that. We really need to change the way we grow our lettuce because right now we can grow lettuce directly next to a feedlot that has thousands of cows that are pooping directly into the water that we use to water the lettuce. And then surprise, people get sick from that. The United States is so poorly regulated at this point when it comes to our food production, it's ridiculous. Um, but that's, I guess, neither here nor there. Um, eggs is another one. So salm salmonella is a species that is very often found on poultry. Uh, Campylobacter is another one that you can find on a whole bunch of different food surfaces. And then E. coli tends to like meat a whole bunch, especially beef. And so you got to watch it in those areas. Mm. Um, what are some things that can lead to cross contamination of food? We've really talked about all of those things earlier, but not properly storing it, not washing your hands, not using different cutting boards for meat versus veggies, all those things. Describe some waterborne diseases and how can they be prevented. We've already talked about Cryptosporidium parvum when we were talking about um, protozoan cysts. Um, 
Cryptosporidium is a protist that can grow in water. It is very resistant to disinfection. And so that's a good waterborne disease that we have in the United States. Almost all waterborne diseases cause diarrhea, nausea, or vomiting, especially the diarrhea side to that. Um, how can it be prevented? Just proper sanitation and then disinfecting water. Um, those things can help. Filtering water can help too if you have the right kind of filter. What kind of disease is often transmitted through the air? Anything that's a respiratory disease tends to be transmitted through the air. The only thing that you can really do to help filter that stuff out is to allow HEPA filters to circulate the air through the filter. Um, that will catch any bacteria. Very often it will carry vir catch viruses. It depends on the size of the virus though. And so those are things that HEPA filters can help with. Mm. Next up, vectors. We've talked about them just a little bit before. I told you they usually are arthropods, um, which again is buggy type things, mosquitoes, ticks, flies, whatever. Um, this is any living organism that can carry a disease causing microorganism or a pathogen, essentially. Now, ticks can carry Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and Lyme disease, and I'm sure several other diseases that I'm not thinking about right now, so they're an example of a vector. Um, they can also carry diseases for dogs, so you should also try to keep ticks off your dogs as well. Now, vectors are put into two groups depending on whether or not they play an essential role in the life cycle of the thing that they're transmitting. In biological vectors, they do play an essential role. So in the case of malaria, the malaria parasite actually needs the mosquito so that it can carry out a portion of its life cycle within the mosquito. And then the mosquito spits out a larval stage into us and it continues to develop in us. But if it weren't for the mosquito, not only would it not get into us, it wouldn't be able to complete that essential part of its life cycle. And so the plasmodium parasite would just die out. Mechanical vectors, on the other hand, play no role in the reproduction of the organism. All they do is pick the pathogen up at point A and drop it off at point B. So they're really just spreaders. They're not participating in the life cycle of the organism. Um, next up, what are some of the pathogen factors that influence the epidemiology of disease? Number one, how virulent is it? If you have a disease that is more virulent, it's going to affect more people in the population. If it's less virulent, it won't affect all that many people in the population. Um, right now, COVID is again caused by SARS-CoV-2. It is a very virulent pathogen that can cause severe disease in some people. Um, the dose of the infection, this is something I talked about in previous chapters. Remember, the dose makes the poison. Same thing when it comes to infectious agents. If you just swallow one cholera bacteria, you're gonna be fine, because again, you have an immune system. But if you drink this water, which this is the Ganges River, and it has a dead animal floating past you and then 18,000 tons of cow poop floating past you, plus the human sewage gets dumped directly in here, but you still use it to brush your teeth and take your bath, which PS people do that on this river, you're being exposed to way more of the cholera pathogen, so you're much more likely to get sick. Mm -hmm. Incubation period. The reason why this matters, it has to do with whether or not the pathogen is actually infectious during the incubation period. If there's a long incubation period where a person does not know they're sick, but they're still spreading that infection, it makes the infection more likely to infect more people. Um, the story that I usually talk about here, um, it really it goes back to the 1960s, which I know you guys all think is ancient history. Um, there was a swarm, an epidemic, an outbreak of typhoid fever in this town in Switzerland. Well, it has an incubation period of two weeks. And so what would happen is people would go, they would ski in the Swiss Alps and have this wonderful vacation, but they drank some contaminated water while they were there. Then they went back home. They didn't get sick until they got back home because it takes two weeks for typhoid to actually develop. And so what happens is the epidemiologist has to always ask, have you traveled because that plays a role in where you may have picked up that infection. The people didn't get typhoid in the area where they lived. They got it when they went on vacation and then returned, but it incubated and so they didn't get sick until they returned. Hmm. What are some host factors that influence the epidemiology of disease? Number one, immunity to a pathogen. So when swine flu came circling around, it turned out that people that were in the baby boomer generation were more likely to have natural immunity to that pathogen because they had been exposed to a similar one earlier in their lives, and so they were just more likely to be immune. Vaccination also plays a huge role in how much of the population is immune to a specific pathogen.
Number two, what's the general health of your population? Clearly, if this kid gets a flu virus, it is much more likely to kill him than it is these healthy seniors running off over here because his or her general health is just much poorer. This person is going to have a very weak immune system because you can tell they're malnourished and you need proteins to mount an immune response and this person's just not gonna have enough protein circulating in their body to do that. Uh, number three, age. As we've looked at COVID-19, we have seen that it tends to affect older people much more severely. However, we have recently discovered that there is a complication that is more likely to develop in younger people who get COVID. Um, we're at this point calling it Kawasaki-like syndrome because it's like Kawasaki disease, except that it has some weird weird symptoms that we don't quite match up to pure Kawasaki disease, but there's different symptoms that you see in those different age groups. Uh, number four, gender. Women are more likely to get urinary tract infections than men. That's a factor of the fact that we have to wipe after every bathroom break versus guys can just shake it off after most of theirs. And two, we have a shorter urethra, so bacteria can travel that a lot faster in us. But again, relating to COVID-19, men are more likely to suffer complications of COVID-19 than women are. So we're seeing a testosterone linkage between how virulent that disease is and how it tends to, uh, in women, be more protective. Our estrogen helps us out there. Um, five, religious and cultural practices. Um, going to religion, certain religions uh, perform circumcision on men within the population and others don't. Um, circumcising has shown to have a slight link in reducing the prevalence of HIV transmission from a, a gentleman who is circumcised to whoever his sexual partner is. Um, not being circumcised slightly increases the risk of that spread. Um, cultural practices, the breastfeeding is the picture that I've got for this one. Um, I was raised to be completely ashamed of my body. It was just the way that I grew up. It was something about the 70s. After the 60s where everybody was free and burning their bras, in the 70s it was repress yourself and don't talk about your sex and blah, blah, blah. And so I would never have breastfed in public. Um, and quite frankly, breastfeeding didn't work out for me, which P.S. it doesn't work out for a lot of people where maybe mom doesn't make enough milk or maybe her kid just can't latch on or whatever. There's a whole slew of reasons why it might not happen. But now you're seeing that out and about in public a little bit more often. Um, and we're seeing, I'll call them uh, breast milk Nazis. We're seeing moms who shame other moms for not breastfeeding. Well, breastfeeding does help pass, uh, passive immunity from the mom to the baby. And so there is a cultural practice of breastfeeding that can help the next generation out. Um, genetic background. The one that's usually talked about as a classic example of how genetics plays a role in immunity goes with sickle cell anemia. Um, people who are homozygous for sickle cell anemia their red blood cells sickle when they become oxygen deprived and that causes massive clotting, extreme pain, and can even lead to death. People who are homozygous for not sickle cell don't have that disease at all, but they are more likely to be able to develop a malaria infection. People who are heterozygous, in other words, one of their genes wants them to be sickle cell, one of their genes doesn't, not only do they not get sickle cell disease, they are more resistant to the malaria parasite, and so there's an advantage to being a heterozygote when it comes to being sickle cell. Um, herd immunity is such an important concept that a lot of people just do not understand. Uh, for this one, I have a video that will hopefully play that a doctor describes it for because I really want you to understand how herd immunity is supposed to work. Thank you. 
improves that chain of transmission. And that's one way that the whole, quote unquote, herd is affected when you uh, protect enough of the population. Well, there are other ways of reducing herd immunity. For example, uh, if, if you uh, immunize enough people, the, uh, you know, there are some bacteria that reside in our normal flora of our, 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 our nasal pharynx, etc. Um, that the overall load of that goes down the community. And therefore, it's not just that we have fewer susceptible people, the overall quantity of bacterium or agent is lower in the community. And so therefore, there are fewer chances for people to get a certain bacterium or for that matter a virus. Uh, and so, so there's different mechanisms of herd immunity, but in a nutshell, herd immunity is that we vaccinate a, a proportion of population Okay, so here's why this is such an important concept for you to understand. There are some people who cannot receive vaccines. That's people who are immunosuppressed, either because they have an autoimmune disease, they have a cancer, or there are people out there who can't receive a vaccine because their immune system's not actually strong enough to generate immunity from a vaccine, and the vaccine could in fact make them very ill. If we protect enough of the population, we protect those people who cannot get the vaccine. Not because they don't want to, because they heard on Facebook that blah, 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 because they medically cannot receive that vaccine. We protect them when we vaccinate everybody who can receive a vaccine. And so it's very important that anybody who can receive a vaccine, especially for very dangerous infections like tetanus or polio, that we vaccinate as many people as we possibly can to protect those that we can't protect in any other way. Uh, next up, your book switches gears and it starts to talk about all the different ways that we can study an infectious agent once we realize that it's present in a population. Um, this one, so I'm going to take you back to some books that I read when I was still in high school because yeah, I've been a nerd for a real long time. Virus Hunter is one of those books. There's another one out there called Hot Zone that I'm told they turned into like a docu documentary type thing on like Netflix or something. Um, I will tell you that Hot Zone especially, it's, it's not super realistic. It is very sensationalized, but it can help interest you in the idea. Like I wanted to be an epidemiologist since high school because of that book. And I didn't realize at the time that it was so sensationalized, but now that I've grown up and learned a lot more, I've realized he's kind of blown up some of the infections that were happening in there. But with Hot Zone, it was about Ebola and how that might spread to the United States and then wipe out a lot of the United States. That's an interesting sort of thing. So that's epidemiology. It's looking at the disease and how it might spread or cause problems. So descriptive studies. What I want you to write down is up here. I've gotten the words back on the slide for you so you can pause the video so you can get it. So I showed you pictures earlier from the most recent MMWR that's about COVID. Um, descriptive studies help us do things like know who's more at risk of developing severe disease. When the disease first came out, we thought it was going to affect people who had more respiratory problems, and so chronic lung disease was on here. As it turns out, it's really doing more damage to the circulatory system than it is to the respiratory system, although because those two things are so closely tied together, the damage that happens here, most notably what it does is it makes the blood vessels leakier and it causes clotting. That damages the capillaries around the lungs, which then presents as a lung disease. They reported that things like people with asthma would have increased risk, and as it turns out, that's not true. Asthma it does not seem to be one of the diseases that increases the risk of a person developing severe COVID disease. Instead, it's diseases that affect primarily the circulatory system that are going to be the ones that have major problems if they contract that illness. Um, Things you need to know about a person if you are doing a descriptive study. You need to know how old they are. You need to know are they male to female? Are they gender neutral or whatever they identify with as a gender? Um, you need to know their ethnicity. Uh, you need to know their occupation. You need to know their personal habits, especially as related to cleanliness. You need to know if they've had any previous illnesses, like again, diabetes or other cardiovascular disease. You need to know their socioeconomic class because as it turns out, how poor you are can directly impact how severely you end up getting sick. Um, it, you need to know marital status and whether or not a person might be cheating on their spouse because that can come into play a role as well. 
and very importantly, and I don't think your book mentions this at this point, you need to know if that person has traveled. Even though there is person to person spread within our community of COVID, that's still one of the questions they always ask is, have you traveled outside of our area? Which that one's not necessarily as important right now, but it was very important as this outbreak was first starting. That was one of the things that got missed when Ebola did arrive in Texas. I don't know how much you remember of the first case that we had in Texas. He had told the nurse that he had traveled. I believe he was from Liberia, which was one of the three countries that were affected by Ebola at the time. The nurse charted it, but as it turned out, the doctor couldn't see what the nurse had actually charted. And so the doctor didn't know the patient was from Liberia. And so it wasn't in his head that the patient might have Ebola and he was sent home to potentially spread the infection amongst his family members at home. And so travel can be a very important thing to know. Um, next, we're gonna start talking about source of infection and what kind of clues that can give. Again, if you get what's written on the slide, you're gonna mostly be okay. Um, that was something that they looked at very hard when COVID first jumped into the population. They traced it to a meat market in Wuhan. And unfortunately, that meat market sells a whole bunch of items that are poached, including they sell bat meat, they sell pangolin meat, they sell turtle meat, they sell all these things that we in the United States might not think of as food, but that people in those countries do view as food. And we are still not sure what species this jumped from to get into people. Right now, the two leading ideas were the first two that I mentioned, bats, which are the leading idea, except that when we look at the genetic sequence of SARS-CoV-2, it more closely resembles a coronavirus that's found in pangolins, and so it might have come from pangolins and not bats. They are still trying to figure out who it jumped from to get into people, but that's a source of infection story for you, essentially. Okay, if there's a common source epidemic, it means everybody was exposed to the same thing and they all got sick at that same event. The classic example of this is from Legionnaires. So the American Legion is an organization that veterans of US military forces can join and they have meetings and they go to conferences and there's these whole things. Um, well, during one of their conferences, the hotel that they were staying at had to turn on a water unit that they had not used in a long time because there were so many people that had come in for this conference, they needed more water for showers and things like that. Well, since it had not been heated to high temperatures while it was on standby, this bacterium that causes Legionnaire's disease bloomed within that um, water unit. And so as the Legionnaires started to take showers, they were being bathed in aerosolized bacteria that had been growing in that water unit. And so pretty much everybody that was staying in that hotel got sick. That's a common source epidemic. And it was because of the water unit that had not been utilized recently. A propagated epidemic is one that spreads from person to person, and that's what COVID is. And I chose this picture just because it's super adorable, um, but also super gross all at the same time. Swine flu going back a little over a decade at this point. Um, it, the, the evidence shows that it first jumped from a pig into a child that was in ooh, someplace in Mexico, Veracruz, Mexico, and the child was five years old. And then he spread it to his parents who spread it to more people and it started to propagate out from what is known as the index case. The index case is essentially patient zero. It's the first person that we know of that that disease got into and then it started to spread from that point. Now, the reason I chose this picture is to show you again, kids that are five-year-old, which this child is not five years old, but kids that are that young, they have no hygiene standards whatsoever. They will lick pigs. They will pick up poop from the ground and eat it. They'll pick up a bug from someplace and throw it in their mouth, a frog, and put it in their mouth. They really just don't care. If they see it, they're like a shark. Let's taste it and see what happens from there, and then they'll cry because it tasted like crap. But whatever, I guess that's part of their learning curve is put it in my mouth and see what happens. That does help them to build up a stronger immune system, but it does also make them little disease carriers that love to spread the disease first to their parents. The people who are supposed to love them with all their heart and soul, they're the ones that are going to suffer because their little kid just licked a pig. Hmm. Uh, describe analytical studies. Definition for you is up there. This is where we start to actually try to figure out what exactly is going on? What is the causative agent? What risk factors do matter? Um, what treatments can actually help us out. And we're looking at everything to figure out how we can solve this epidemic or pandemic or outbreak or whatever it happens to be. Um, once again, definitions are all up there. Go ahead and get what it says. Um, 
cross-sectional studies, um, this is kind of what kind of what they were looking at in that CDC thing where they were talking about it's affecting men more than women. That's how we started to know we need to look at why is it affecting men more than women. Now I mentioned there's a testosterone link. If you don't know that much about male pattern baldness, it actually results from a more potent type of testosterone that those men produce than people who don't get male pattern baldness. And so that is a piece of evidence that we have developed with COVID because men who have male pattern baldness are more likely to suffer from um, a more severe form of the disease than men who don't. And so that's how we know testosterone plays a role somehow. They're still looking into how it plays that role though. Retrospective study looks back in time to figure out what actually mattered. So this is very important and governments should listen to their scientists and that is a problem that the United States is happening right now. But different countries try different things to try to flatten their curve. South Korea and Singapore tested heavily. Essentially they tried to test every single member of their population routinely to see who has the disease and then quarantine those people immediately instead of just finding out oh, you've had the disease and you've had it for a month? Well, crap, who have you contacted? And then do contact, taste, uh, contact tracing, pardon me, to try to figure out who they've interacted with. Testing them beforehand reduces that contact tracing down so that you're not having to go out and talk to 500 people. Now you only have to talk to two people because you caught it that much earlier. So the evidence from the retrospective studies are showing us that increased testing is the number one thing a community can do to wipe the disease out faster within that community. And again, US federal government, especially Trump, is not supporting that. He has decided he doesn't want to do any more testing because it makes it look like the numbers are high. Well, guess what? The numbers are high. We need to test more people and we need to lock it down again because we're seeing an increase in cases right now. Case control studies just has a control group to compare your cohort or your variable group to. Um, this was a study that is uh, being started, I believe, by the World Health Organization. And what I want you to notice is they've got a cohort and then they have a control group. I'm looking for where they had their control group. There we go. So they're only recruiting healthcare workers who are being exposed to people who have COVID-19. And then they're going to look at the differences between their control group and their cohort group to see what they can do to decrease the risk of healthcare workers contracting COVID-19. So that's an example of a case control study in relation to this new disease. Perspective studies are the opposite of retrospective. They're looking ahead and not behind. Um, so it's all of those risk factors that we have been coming up with, like being a man, having cardiovascular disease or diabetes, does it actually show out in the modern data that those are the real risk factors that increase a person's risk over time? Essentially what we're trying to do by developing the risk factors is figure out how many emergency room beds are we going to need? How many ventilators are we going to need? The prospective study helps us get that approximate number out there so that hospitals can be prepared for that stuff. And then we can look at, were we right? Did we actually have the right risk factors? Or like when they first were looking out and they were telling people to, people who had lung disease, that was the risk factor. Well, that was wrong. It was the cardiovascular stuff that seemed to have more of an impact. So the first perspective stuff was actually incorrect about COVID-19. Uh, cohort group is just the variable group. Experimental studies. Um, this you have to have animal models for because in today's America, you cannot just infect people with disease to see how things are going to work out. Um, we know that COVID can be spread into cats, including tigers. And um, it can get into dogs, although it doesn't seem to be able to jump from dogs to people, just people to dogs. It can get into mink. In fact, ooh, it was one of the Dutch countries or up there. I think it was the Netherlands. Their entire mink population is having to be wiped out because COVID jumped from people into their mink that they use as fur. And so they're having to wipe those guys all out. So we've got some animal models that we can use to find out what is the infectious dose, what treatments work the best, what risk factors matter the most, things like that. Um, experimental studies can also be used to test drugs and vaccines to see which of those will be better as treatment options. Um, this is one of the first women who received one of the experimental vaccines for COVID, and so that's why I'm showing you her picture. She's testing a vaccine. She's in the, she doesn't actually know if she's in the experimental group or if she's in the placebo group, but she's part of the trial. Um, so I mentioned placebo a second ago.
Um, this, like in an injection, we would just inject you with normal saline, um, but you're still getting the same injection that everybody else is getting, like the same amount of injection. You're just not getting the drug that's actually being tested. This is because we have known for a long time that there is a placebo effect. There are a number of diseases where a placebo is just as good a treatment as whatever the experimental treatment happens to be. And so placebos, we have to knock that out and know that the treatment is better than a placebo, ideally. Double blind trials means, here, here's what it's trying to counteract. If a doctor knows that they are testing the vaccine versus a placebo, they might go in there and hint to the patient hey, we know this is going to work. And then that puts the idea into the patient's head. I'm special and I'm receiving the actual treatment and I should be better as a result of this. And so it, it institutes this bias when the doctor or the patient knows what they're receiving. When you do a double blind trial, the doctor doesn't know what they're injecting. They might be injecting you with the placebo or they might be using the actual drug. They don't know. And so that means they're not going to be dropping those little hints that might change the way you actually behave or change the way you feel about what you're experiencing. Um, this is not really something that your book mentions all that much, but the term randomized control trial, um, it's the gold standard, like I said up here. If you read any scientific publications whatsoever, they're gonna talk about RCTs, randomized control trials. Um, they are double blind, so again, the researcher nor the patient knows what's going on. The randomized part is very important. If it's not randomized, you can take like the six stoutest, healthiest looking people and compare them to the six weakest, palest looking people. Well, that's not an equal comparison. So when you randomize who goes into which group, you're equalizing the two groups from each other and that makes your data more reliable. Um, you also do have to have a control group that receives a placebo versus the cohort group that's getting the group. So, so ideally, we also add that randomized part to it. Um, next up, you have CDC. CDC is the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I don't know why the prevention part doesn't get a letter in their acronym. Um, where is it headquartered? They're in Atlanta, Georgia. What is its mission? Um, essentially, it's in their name. They try to control and prevent the spread of diseases within the population, primarily of the United States, but they do go abroad if it appears that that disease has a chance of coming to the United States, which based on travel, almost all diseases do. So they go to, eat, they go to Africa when there's an Ebola outbreak and so on and so forth. Um, they collect data on diseases that impact human health just as a general rule, and they play a big role in education and sending out literature about different diseases. If you have listened to your bosses, your coworkers, the news, your governor, whatever, they're always talking about how they're following CDC guidelines. Well, those guidelines came from them doing some of those analytical studies that we were just talking about a little bit ago. The CDC also publishes the NMWR, which is the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. It used to be an actual little pamphlet that used to come out, but nowadays it's all done through email. You can sign up for the NMWR for free. They publish a lot of really good information that any healthcare worker really should know about. Um, although it's very often it's studies about specific places where there's an outbreak of something in a little area. But sometimes, like with COVID, it's more worldwide, the NMWR. Um, it summarizes the status of a number of different diseases, and now they have these interactive tables that you can play with to see how many cases there are of any uh, notifiable disease. The WHO is the World Health Organization. It's an agency of the UN, which is the United Nations. What is its mission? Um, essentially, it's similar to the CDC, so huge component on education. Um, they try to provide guidance to countries who might not have the best um, medical network in place. They set standards for health worldwide, including which vaccines should be given to which populations. Um, they strengthen national health programs by providing some of those vaccines, for example. And they develop and transfer health technology from point A to point B. Um, right now, one of their primary goals is, of course, about COVID, but their second most important thing that they're trying to do right now relates to this picture, which is eradicate polio. Polio is only endemic to a few countries still at this point. It's been eradicated from every place else in the world. Um, it's difficult to eradicate this because it can live in the water for a period of time after it's been released through feces into the water. But we are within reach of actually eradicating polio. However, the vaccine that the WHO uses in the African countries used a weakened type of virus 
that has become virulent again. So there is a current outbreak of vaccine-derived polio that is problematic. Mm. Um, next up, we talked about emerging diseases earlier, uh, but it's important to understand why some diseases are re-emerging. So what are some of the factors that can uh, relate to this? So evolution, microbes are changing all the time. The more we stress them, the faster they evolve. That has to do with they stop using some of their proofreading enzymes for DNA when they start to get stressed. So they actually change faster when they're stressed. Um, complacency. This kind of goes back to there's a lot of people who haven't seen polio. So why should I vaccinate my kid against polio if I haven't seen it? They've become complacent about things like vaccination and that makes diseases reemerge like measles, mumps, uh, rubella. Um, let's see, whooping cough is another one. Um, there's a bunch of diseases that are re-emerging because of that complacency. Uh, changes in society. Used to be mom stayed home with her kids all the time, but as cost of living has increased, moms have had to go back to work, which means daycares have become a thing. Daycares are once again little breeding grounds for different diseases, and so that's a change in society that has allowed some diseases to emerge. Mm. Um, advances in technology. So we've got stuff like menstrual cups that didn't used to exist. We have tampons that didn't used to exist. Um, those things increase the risk of toxic shock syndrome because they create habitat for the species that causes toxic shock syndrome. And so that's a technological advancement that increases a disease that hadn't existed prior. Well, um, the one that your book, I think, mentions at this point is about contacts. Contacts are a relatively new invention, but they do increase the chance of conjunctivitis. Um, population expansion. When the human species moves into places where we didn't used to be, we get exposed to whatever diseases are in that area where we didn't used to be. That is one of the things that has led to the rise in Lyme disease that started back in the 70s when people moved to Connecticut in areas where we didn't used to live. Um, development. When we start building dams and rivers and creating pools of water, stagnant pools of water tend to breed diseases. Um, mass production of food. This goes back to we now have feedlots with lots of cows making lots of poop directly next door to the place where we grow acre upon acre upon acre of lettuce. And so the chance that our lettuce is contaminated is much higher because of how we mass produce our food now. Um, war and civil unrest. If your nation's at war, are you really going to be all that concerned about your vaccine status? Probably not. And climate change. Um, Any time there is an El Nino year, there's an increase in the prevalence of cholera within a population. Um, flooding also brings more contaminated water into areas where it didn't used to be, and so you see more cases of like flesh-eating vibrio that didn't used to be in a certain spot. Um, Healthcare-associated infections are infections picked up in any healthcare setting. Uh, your book kind of changes the definition of nosocomial to be hospital acquired. Usually nosocomial just means it's a health uh, healthcare acquired infection. Um, list the infectious agents that tend to cause healthcare associated infections. So staph aureus is probably number one. If you go in and have anything cut or poked on you, the chance that you get a staph infection is relatively high. Pseudomonas infections, that's one of our um, Holy moly, the word just left my head. It was in there just a second ago. It's one of our opportunistic pathogens. It doesn't cause disease in normal people, but people that are in the hospital, they're not normal. They had a problem. That was why they were in the hospital. So it's more likely to make people sick. Um, Enterococcus and E. coli are pretty high risks, and Canada and C. diff are other high risks. What are the reservoirs for infectious agents in healthcare settings? Uh, number one, other patients. Again, they're there for a reason. They were sick. If they cough on you, you're going to get whatever they had. Um, the environment, especially the bathrooms, are places where pathogens tend to linger around, but respirators do also aerosolize any respiratory infection. Healthcare workers can transmit an infection that they had and didn't know they had, or they can just spread an infection as sort of a mechanical vector from point A to point B. And then number four, the patient's own microbiota. What you need to remember here is that all of your microbiome, it's supposed to be in a specific area. If it moves to a different area, it can cause an infection in that area. Um, how do infectious agents get transmitted? We've talked about this like a bazillion times already, but fomite transmission, direct transmission, and airborne transmission, that's how it's getting onto a patient in a healthcare setting. What are some things that can be done to prevent nosocomial infections? Number one, all family that is visiting and all healthcare workers should wash their hands before they visit anybody in their hospital room. 
Um, instruments that get used on the patient should be disinfected and or sterilized, depending on whether they're cri uh, critical or semi-critical. Um, PPE should be worn if there is any risk of uh, a communicable disease. Um, patients need to have proper instruction, like they shouldn't, there are a lot of people out there who believe that after they cough something up, they should spit it out. Well, if you just spit that crap on the floor of the hospital room, that's a potential infection waiting to spread to another person. And so they need to be instructed not to do that. They can spit it into a tissue and throw it away if they really feel like they need to. But your digestive system will clean whatever was in there. So if you just swallow it, it's perfectly fine because your digestive system will kill and then just digest the mucus so that you can make even more mucus. Yay. Um, there should also be a, an infection control committee at the hospital. They are there to look at any practices that are not happening like they're supposed to. The story that I'll give you that relates to that, um, I had a friend that's an epidemiologist that used to work for Parkland Hospital. Um, the endoscope is considered to be a semi-critical instrument. The endoscope ended up being the mode of transmission for a C. diff infection amongst numerous people that had come in for just routine colonoscopies during the course of a day, and it was all because it got disinfected, not sterilized. Because it is considered semi-critical, they didn't have to sterilize it, and so the infection control committee that she was the head of told them, you need to actually sterilize this instead of just disinfecting it. Um, she ended up getting fired because they didn't want to do that, which goes back to people don't like to be told what to do, and sometimes you will face some backlash. Um, next up, the two model organisms that I have for this chapter, the first one is Staph aureus. It relates to these nosocomial infections we were just talking about. What is the Gram reaction? You can see it in the picture. You should know what it means at this point. Since this organism is part of the normal flora, why does it sometimes cause disease? It's an opportunistic pathogen, so if the person's immunocompromised, it's more likely to make them sick. But it can also colonize wounds. It doesn't ordinarily live in the skin very well. It actually is usually up in the nasal cavity, so if it gets into broken skin, it can cause an infection of that. Um, what is MRSA? It is methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. So usually Staph aureus can be treated fairly easily. We just give them methicillin, it clears the infection, and it goes away. In MRSA, methicillin can't be used to treat it because the bacteria is resistant to that antibiotic, and so we have to go to a different antibiotic called vancomycin to treat that. Vancomycin is an IV drug. You can't just go home and take a pill. You have to go in for infusions of vancomycin. It also has a higher risk of side effects, and so it is not an ideal treatment option necessarily. Um, what is VISA? It is vancomycin intermediate staph aureus. So remember from our antibiotic susceptibility test what intermediate means. It means that we can use that as a treatment option, but we have to use higher doses or take it for longer periods of time. So vancomycin is slowly stopping working against uh, VISA. There is also VERSA, which is vancomycin resistant, which means even vancomycin doesn't work for that infection anymore, which essentially means it's very difficult to treat that and it's fairly toxic, the other treatment options that we have to use for Visa and Versa. Uh, what are some of the routes of transmission for this organism? Direct contact with the carrier, again like the person picks their nose and then touches their wound, it can spread that way. Um, it can also be spread through fomites. Uh, consumption of contaminated food can also lead to a GI problem with Staph aureus. Yersinia pestis is the big bad of bacteria, it's the one that causes plague. What's the Gram reaction? It's negative. What's the vector? Fleas. If you get bitten by a flea that has the bacteria in its mouth, then you can get the plague from the flea. What is the reservoir? Rats. So basically, the bacteria lives in rats, the flea bites a rat, and then the flea goes and bites you, and so it took the, the plague bacteria, your Yersinia pestis, from the rat to you, and now you are infected by that. All right. So. Every year the CDC changes how you can collect the data from their MMWR. So now I have this and it's fresh as of 2020. So if you're watching this video after 2020, I'm sure this is not how you do it anymore, but here's how you're going to get to the MMWR. Go to this link, cdc.gov slash MMWR. Once you get to that page, you're gonna scroll all the way towards the bottom and you've got this banner. You're gonna click on MMWR metrics. From there, up towards the top left, click on Publications, and then Notifiable Infectious Diseases. Then click on Annual Notifiable Diseases Tables Figures for 2016 and later, because we want the most recent data. Um, 
then click on weekly and annual tables. Mm. Then um, there's a list of tables on CDC Wonder. Um, I have not found an easier way to search for this stuff. There might be one. I just didn't have time to look at it for longer than I already had at this point. But just pick any table on that list, click on the table, and start looking down for Texas. Um, and then there's different diseases that are listed, but the column that comes first for any disease is how many cases have been reported for this week. Um, this particular disease, there were no reportings, but this one had four. This one happens to be syphilis, so don't use syphilis since I'm talking about syphilis right now. Texas had four reported cases of syphilis for the current week that we are currently in, and then this starts to give us cumulative totals for the year up over here, so how many cases Texas has had for a longer period of time. Once you have found a disease that Texas has had some of for this week, you can start answering the questions that go into the notes. So things like, what's the causative agent? For syphilis, it's trypanema pallidum. What is the reservoir? People. How is it spread? Sex. How many people caught it this week? Four. In which states did they live? I'm just having you look at Texas, so Texas. Try to pick something that you want to learn more about. So when you start looking at the table, start looking at diseases that you think sound kind of interesting or diseases that you have no idea about and you just kind of want to learn more about. Um, I did have the disclaimer that you can't pick any disease that we've mentioned in the notes, but because they have made it a little bit more difficult to navigate through all of those tables, it's okay if you use a disease that we have talked about in the notes. Just don't use syphilis, and then I'm happy.